complex, the Bible is complex. Human existence is a tangled ball of experience, perception, and understanding. Ravel is a puzzling word, denoting both a tangling and untangling. This podcast attempts to hold honest conversations in good faith. Some ideas expressed in this podcast will be challenging. Others will be obvious. When a PhD in biblical interpretation and a habitually podcasting man-child discuss matters of society, scripture, and scandal, you get Ravel. Hey everybody, you are listening to Ravel, and it's me, your best buddy, Basil. And with me, as always, um, I've got the human man, tall, Dr. Christopher Ryan Gates. Hello. <laughs> Did you call me tall? You know, yeah, it came to my attention that maybe I've been putting a little bit too much flourish on uh, some of that, so I wanted to go back to basics. <laughs> well, most people would not describe me as tall, but uh, mm. I do appreciate it. <laughs> okay, good. Well, you know, part of, part of my goal is not just to accurately describe you, but also flatter you and um, uh, yes. maybe maybe sort of like an aspirational uh, type of, uh, you know, speak that over you, brother. Well, thank oh, you. You are yeah. tall. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. I feel How tall, tall are you? Is, is this something we should we should talk about? Is that what this whole episode is going to be about? How uh, tall I mean, I'm, are you? I am 5'8 on my best oh. day so okay that's when my posture is you know perfect wow. um yes so this, this changes everything uh yes uh my brother uh my younger brother uh uh-huh. is uh six three i believe so wow uh he is a true uh a true norseman uh, a me true and tall and man not so much but uh i feel tall you know it's okay not the yeah size of the dog and the fight but the size of the fight and the dog is that what they say and these are the type of riveting conversations folks that you can Mm -hmm. only find on these asked and not answered episodes of ravel and we are here today um first of all to are we going to make have we made an official full-scale stat rundown of your big announcement (laughs) <laughs> no, no, we haven't. You gotta get the um, gotta get the stats, man. the 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 bookies are itching yeah. to get uh, to put the odds on this little guy. Tell us, tell us, tell us everything. Yes, yes, it was uh, here on March twenty seventh, um, just about uh, oh nine days ago from the time of this recording right now, um, at eight thirty seven in the morning. Um, that my son, Simon Christopher Gates, was uh, welcomed into the world. Um, he came in at uh, 20 and a half inches and 11.0 pounds, um, 11 pounds even. Um, Chonky boy. Yes, for those right? of you who I mean, I, are d- not I don't really know. F- yeah, familiar. <laughs> On average, babies are somewhere between, you know, seven to nine pounds or something. Uh, so a whole extra, you know, three to four Couple pounds, pounds, depending on how Couple you're looking LBs. at it. But yeah, and uh, we had a little bit of didn't quite go how we how we were wanting. We were trying to go for a whole natural sort of uh, birth thing, um, but you couldn't get to the of, the bathtub in time for the water birth. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was we were getting into he we were about we were getting close to forty two weeks there, and kind of a little bit wondering. Uh, so we went in for an ultrasound. Turns out his head was, you know, up top where it's not supposed to be. He was mm. down low to begin with, but um, my wife, there was something going on where she was. There's, I mean, they explained it all to us, but I'll spare you all the details. Uh, producing a little. Oh, extra I get it. The old, the amniotic, old upright baby syndrome. Yes, the breach, the breach presentation. She had a little extra fluid there. 
Uh, and when I say a little extra, they mm. said it was about a liter and a half extra. So mm, he that's had this a lot of fluid. Yes, he had this nice, you know, big swimming pool that he was in, and his giant head just kept on floating up to the top there, I guess. And uh, <laughs> he could not get into position. So they said, "He's you're about forty two weeks, and his head is not down. So we should probably just go ahead and get him out of there." You know, they said, "He's fine. You're fine. There's no emergency. You can wait it out for another week if you want to, but he's only." got to get bigger uh so we just said you know it was not what we wanted but we felt like it was you know the lord brought us to that place and um everything went really well there at the hospital ended up being a c-section and um you know not what we had hoped for but what happens so often these days um sure. and he came out um it scared me for a little bit because he didn't he wasn't moving around too much he's very calm coming out and just kind of mm. didn't make any noise didn't move and i was looking i'm gonna like, watch out for uh, the quiet uh, ones yeah uh so they smacked him around a little bit you know uh mm -hmm. and uh, it took almost a yeah. full 30 seconds before he made a noise and i was i was gripped with a little bit of you know panic there for a moment i'm like is this kid alive uh yeah. but he was and he has just been so wonderful. Um, we love him so much. People say that he looks like me. It's, uh, I don't know. I'd, uh, it'd be up to everyone to decide, I suppose. Uh, there's, I've posted some pictures of him on my personal uh, Instagram and Facebook. You can go, you know, find a look there. I sent you a picture, of course, day of there. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, Number one. You, of course, you told me before you even told your my wife own, that it was My mother, was yeah. Finished. Yeah, yeah, you were right. there uh, before my mom. So, um, see, you, folks, <laughs> he loves. He's me. been he great. Really does he's very well behaved? If he ever whimpers, it's just he either needs to be fed or he just wants to be held. And um, he is. We love him so much. He's so wonderful. And uh, it's in those early stages where you just look at him and you're just like, I can't. How could I ever? ever get frustrated or annoyed with you you're so perfect everything you do is perfect. Uh, the uh, mushy daddy stuff the mushy yeah. gushy daddy stuff i get it we get it chris yeah well that's we're all very excited of course i uh, couldn't help myself i did announce it on a different podcast uh, but i didn't have any of the stats and i had people yes. asking for stats so now i know where to tell them to go for the stats yeah, an 11 pound baby. That's uh, everybody. I mean, the staff at the hospital, they were gasping. Uh, yeah. I was like, is this kid a mutant or something? But um, how do you know how much you weighed when you were a baby? I do actually, because it came up. Um, I was actually 10.8 pounds. So. Yeah, big baby <laughs> following, doctor. Yes, following after yeah. his uh, father. You're, n you're, you're not going to believe this. But I, I only know this because uh, it was on a cross stitch that was hanging in my house for my entire life. This is a cross stitch of all my stats, which probably is the source of my obsession with baby stats because I got to look <laughs> at mine forever. Uh, it's going to sound unbelievable, and maybe it's not correct, but it, it, it was on the cross stitch. Uh, I don't know where this cross stitch came from. But it had stats. Fourteen pounds. Fourteen Whoa. pounds. Little, you were? Little, little baby Basil, fourteen pound baby. Holy smokes. Yeah. I know. You should have seen my quads. It was all quads <laughs> and glutes. Very powerful. We Very did powerful look kid. it up, uh, my wife and I, just out of curiosity, because when people are like, 11 is big, it's like, what was the biggest baby ever? And I think the uh, biggest baby ever was like 21 pounds, yeah, which is well, insane. Um, but yeah, that's 14 bigger than, is huge. It's too. up there. It's up there, man. And I thought it was normal my whole life. Uh, until I started knowing people having babies, and they're having all these tiny little scrawny babies. Yes. Uh, but 11's pretty good. 11's pretty yes. good. Not, not, not saying nothing about that. Well, thank you for the details, Chris. We're all very excited. The first Ravel baby has, ah, yeah. uh, has yes, he graced is. us. Yes. Yes, he is. Okay. Well... Are you ready to to move to get to business? Is I don't want to cut I guess you off so. if you have yeah, more I was things teaching, to brag about. 
I was teaching yesterday at the college, and uh, it was my first. It was my first class back, and I spent about the first fifteen minutes of class just talking about my son. And it was, you know, I don't want to be that guy, but uh, listen, I could. I could just sit here all day and talk about him. He's yeah. so awesome. But we should. It is probably, your duty. I'll, well, we got to sprinkle it in along yeah. you know, the way with other episodes and things like that. But yeah, it's exactly. so, those of you who are parents. You know exactly, and I, I'm not trying to be, you know, whatever. If you're not a parent, it's just, it's, I didn't really fully understand it until you kind of get an idea of it, but there's almost no point in talking about it, because if you know, you know, and if you don't, you will someday when yeah. you have a little baby. And hey, those of you listeners out there who don't have a baby, uh, we just got to keep pretending, okay? Just keep <laughs> pretending we understand and just keep pretending. Be just every time he says something, just act impressed, and uh, we're gonna get through this. Okay, uh, the long sleepless nights, <laughs> the runs to the grocery store for whatever. Uh, we're gonna make it through. It's just a couple years. Okay, and back to the show. Uh, <laughs> uh, we are wrapping up our artists on series. Thank you, everybody, for tuning into it and all your kind words. Um, and I just had such a fun time. It was such a, uh, yeah, I, I like to think that we already did a pretty good job on this show with um, expanding the various topics and perspectives and voices and being open and honest enough to explore things uh, from different perspectives. Uh, but I think talking to all these artists really pushed the limits, really pushed the uh, pushed the envelope a little bit, at least for me. I don't know. Again, going back to, uh, I mean, gosh, almost every, I mean, I will say every, every artist we talked to, um, the, the interior design talk with uh, Margaret Daniels was Oh, mm -hmm. a total favorite of mine. Loso episode, the battle rap. I mean, that is a that is a classic moment, a classic episode um, that we'll be <laughs> remembering fondly far into the future. Uh, most recently, Elliot Morgan. Um, you know, yep, we had yep. to get a heathen on the show. We couldn't couldn't just you know forget about the old heathens um yes. so that was fun and don't worry elliot we'll get you saved one of these days mm -hmm. uh and don't take offense if you think i'm taking that too lightly folks just know i take it very seriously um of course we had uh phil porto and the uh, the the mission the, the very worthy mission um, to educate and inspire the church to support art and artists in a very real, tangible way, which, my gosh, if that was a movement that started catching on, um, that would be a very satisfying feeling for us to have been a part of that. And, mm -hmm. of course, full of eyes, full of eyes, um, who I recently got a message from who has been making progress on his uh, his metaverse uh, situation, which we're gonna have to check in on him with for yeah. about yeah, um, and we have plans for that in the future. Tell he me actually too, uh -huh. uh, Christopher Powers. Uh, I've stayed in touch with him, and uh, he just recently uh, volunteered to. He's going to make a visual exegesis for. Uh, a Bible verse for a piece for Simon for his birth. He's doing. Oh uh, my <laughs> I gosh! Was, I was sitting with my wife in the nursery and I uh, got a text from him, and and uh, he was just congratulating me. And I kind of, you know, I said, "Have you done one on Simon?" Means it's from the Hebrew Simeon, and Simon is the Greek version of it, but it means the Lord has heard. And I asked him if he had done one for the Shema, uh, "Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one," and he. Said, said uh why don't i just do a, i'll just do a custom one for your son just tell me which verse you want and um we picked a verse out of first john and he's gonna do a custom one so i'll be sure to share that maybe uh if we get him back on to talk about the metaverse that'll be done by then and it'll be a little thing to talk about but he's Holy I mean, a great friend of the show already here. what a pressure what a pressure I know. treasure treasure yes i uh, yeah and uh yeah i was bragging about my cross stitch uh, I can't imagine what kind of 
developmental quirks having a visual exegesis done by a incredible artist uh, hanging on your wall or I guess it might just be in your NFT wallet or something for <laughs> Simon but whatever the case may be that's incredible yeah. okay is, we're, look we're at this blessed. yeah we're making friends making friends and so far no enemies to speak of so I think this has been a total win no enemies <laughs> Well, besides each other, but that's less enemies and more sort of rivals, you know? Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I thought there was a couple outside of the show, but that's okay. We can keep moving on. You know? Oh, outside of the show? Yeah. Well, here's the thing about enemies. You want to, uh, you don't want to bestow that honor of enemy on just little old anyone, you know? It's, it's a, it's a serious that's thing. That's true. You, you know, if you are allowing somebody to hold the title of your enemy, you are actually giving them quite a bit of uh, space in your life. And so far, nobody has earned the right to hold that kind of space. Uh, for me, at least, I don't know. You, you're a you, you're a, a, a wide ranging fellow with um, all sorts of mm, abilities and emotional ranges that I could never possibly uh, oh, imagine gosh. containing. I think what it was is I was thinking I mean, you're a parent, much more Chris. broadly than you You're were. a parent, Chris. You're capable of so much more. Apparently, I am. Oh, there he the is. The dad jokes. Okay. <laughs> they're coming. <laughs> yes, they're, they're, they're coming. It's happening. The mantle has been uh... passed. All right, so tell me, what was... Look, we're not here to pick favorites. That's not what this is about. Yeah, never. But uh, was was there a moment um, or, of course, you know, an episode or a moment or a couple of moments that you would like to revisit and talk about from um, the artist ep uh, series? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know the conversation that we had with uh christopher powers and this is not because he's doing a custom piece for my son um but it was it was probably my personal favorite and i think it just had to do with the fact that he uh along with his incredible artistic ability also has this mind that really thinks through kind of theological matters in a sort of academic sense all of the people that we did i mean think deeply about theology everyone who was on the show had uh very interesting insights but i kind of resonated with him a little more because i'm kind of from the same sort of you know ilk as that and he's going through seminary and all of those different things and he had some really wonderful insights that i hadn't really thought about i think his his take on hell actually i think was really really interesting because he you know put it in in the sense that hell is no person will ever experience hell, you know, in the sense that God himself did not first experience it. Uh, something like that. It's a paraphrase. But uh, I had been thinking and pondering on that for a while. And I just thought that's really that's really a brilliant way to put it. And I'll probably incorporate that into my Easter uh, Sunday sermon. <laughs> That'll be coming up here in just a little bit. Um, but uh, that was really good. Um, that was probably my, my favorite of all of them, just cause I felt like you're, you're looking at all of his work and then you're hearing all the stuff he's saying at all. This was so beautiful, but of course, super fun talking to Loso also going through that whole thing. Uh, loved uh, Phil's passion for artists and in general, it kind of was really good and kind of uh, encapsulated the whole series um, in, in a large regard. Um, of course, Elliot Morgan, just uh, hysterical and funny, and that was such a fun, easy conversation. Loved it. And then Margaret Daniel, the unexpected, you know, um, interior design slash, you know, scholar uh, in there. And uh, it was really all, I don't know, it's, it's hard to, if I had to pick a favorite, I would just go slightly towards, uh, you know, the full of eyes conversation. But other than that, I mean, it was, it was so wonderful. So glad yeah. we had a chance to do this. And we had a couple other, you know, suggestions and submissions, uh, but it was kind of at the place where we were already getting ready to uh, close it down here. So we might have to do a volume two um, on yeah. it, perhaps. That's true. We we had uh, a number of other offers and suggestions and, uh, you know, possible interviews that we could have done. And honestly, we did want to do all of them. Um, but, you know, this series was already six episodes deep 
and you know there's i don't know i i i wish the world was such that we could just do that but now we get to do an artists on two or perhaps an artists off series later on um but yeah i think we had a wonderful sort of range uh that we got it to was, hit, uh, yeah. different types of um art that were not just unique but also spoke to um the sort of broader concepts that uh, perhaps would have uh, included some of those other guests but don't worry we have kept all your suggestions and requests and uh of course we'll be moving on those in the future Absolutely. yeah every single episode and i i guess i don't want to get too bogged down by just reviewing for the sake of reviewing sake um, but in the context of you receiving a gift from uh <laughs> from uh christopher powers in the form of a sort of i don't know what is the word uh, 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 immortalization of the <laughs> the naming of your firstborn son uh, in the form of some art. I can look at this list and honestly name gifts that I was given. Uh, for instance, uh, Christopher Powers. Uh, and I'm saying this now, uh, just in case somebody is listening to this episode and did not and has not explored the rest of the series, um, maybe they can uh, have something to look forward to and it'll help them choose which one to listen to first. Uh, with Christopher Powers, I felt so seen and connected <laughs> with him, um, having our deep sort of meandering talks about technology mm, and yeah. giving me you know he sort you of gave me the for sure yeah oh yeah he gave me the opportunity to um really articulate in as condensed of a way as i possibly could um my enthusiasm for exploring technology and how it directly uh, either facilitates or debilitates uh, human spiritual experience and how it hopes to replicate that. That was a true gift because I did not think that I would get to have those types of weird conversations on this show. I don't know. Um, maybe that was just a, a, a me being narrow scoped. Um, with Phil Porto, he just filled me with hope for the future mm. of, uh, of the church and sort of grasping the importance of not just sort of like spiritually supporting artists, but materially supporting artists and making that um, an actual mission uh, where, you know, hopefully I have a, a fantasy that somebody out there in church leadership listened to that episode or is listening to me now and actually makes some moves. I mean, perhaps there is an artist out there now who is being materially supported by a church um, because of, uh, you know, the the articulation of the importance of that with Phil Porto. Um, that's very exciting to me. And if that is the case, let me know. Uh, with Loso, so many gifts, but the opportunity to be vulnerable and cringy and do something that really I'm honestly was terrified to do and still terrifies me to this day that I did do, which was, uh, you know, rap on air, which is not something I've ever done before. Against one of um, the best in the universe. Exactly. If not against, at least in the presence of one of the top <laughs> 10 battle rappers in the universe. Uh, incredible, incredible resume, <laughs> line on my resume. Margaret Daniel, a true treasure, uh, number one, got to get a professional uh, consulting opportunity on my Apocalypse Bunker design, uh, which is worth uh, at least $10,000 if we were going to put an actual price wow. on it. Wow. But you know what really stands out on me and I'm very grateful for? The moment with the Margaret Daniel episode where I went on a classic Basil rant uh, about something I don't even know and I'm thinking I'm feeling I'm vibing thinking I'm just blowing minds and taking names with my my oh my intellect and was met with a sincere complete 
silence from Margaret Daniel for like 10 seconds, Mm -hmm. or at least it felt that way. And uh, somebody might be tempted to think that that I'm being facetious or I'm uh, sort of deflecting or this is some sort of defense mechanism. I am truly touched (laughs) and learned a lot about this craft of ours, Chris, um, by, by that silence. And I am so grateful to Margaret for that. And then of course, Elliot Morgan, um, all I'm fascinated by the idea or not the idea, the stories of people taking journeys in and out of the church. Um, and the way in which he understood the language that I was trying to speak with him um, and the comparison and description of comedy uh, with some sort of like other spiritual practices, calling him a dark wizard uh, and being met with laughter and, uh, and understanding was very valuable to me. So those are just some things um, that really meant a lot to me in this uh, Artists On series. Sounds like it was truly uh, profound in many ways. I uh, thought so. Uh, I felt very good about the whole thing. And that's what this is really all about, right, Chris? <laughs> Making me feel good. <laughs> uh it, i mean i i i agree i didn't know quite uh i didn't know quite if we were uh i i appreciate your reflection on it and i would say that yes there were i didn't maybe put as much thought into it as you did i'm too busy thinking about my newborn child you had a uh, lot going perhaps. on man you had <laughs> a lot going been, on i guess it's a good time to apologize too uh for the delays in uh we had been so consistent in uh, releasing episodes, and mm-hmm. we missed like a whole week, I think, and then a couple episodes were yeah. like three, four days late. Got a little rocky. Got a little rocky there for a bit. Yeah, but you know, there's a lot going on over here on my end. I don't know what your excuses are. I think you have I some do excuses, have, too. I have um, some great excuses, uh, yeah. of which I'm keeping a secret right now, but will be announcing soon. Um, But yes, it's definitely a rocky time for both of us just in life. Beautiful and wonderful time in life, but definitely one that does um, that that sort of mm, requires other things to uh, perhaps move one notch down on the priority list. Not that you guys aren't on the top of our priority list, uh, just some other big life events going on. Yeah. So with that said... Are you satisfied with the review of the series? Was there any topics or anything that you thought maybe we needed to delve into or wanted to or thought might be fun? Uh, you know, I think perhaps, maybe, but mm-hmm. I also know that with this being um, an Ask the Not Answered episode, we have so much more to continue Gotta to get into. Gotta give the people what they want. And I Gotta just, give them what they want. There's lots, and I think in due time, uh, much of what we had discussed, uh, those things that kind of persist in our minds uh, end up coming back up. In, mm-hmm. in additional conversations later on. So I oh, I am fine with leaving it at that and just kind okay. of seeing how that kind of shapes uh, how we move forward from here. And it is one of the fun things as you're, you know, you get to have all these conversations and discussions with stuff. It's part of life in general. Is it all one thing builds on the next, on the next, on the next, and you become this, you know, little reservoir of experience and information that you get to toss back out at any given moment. So I am content to leave it there. Good. Okay, I am also content. Okay, let us move on to some listener engagement yeah. in all different ways. It's always fun. Um, should we do, I forget how we do this. Do we do reviews first or questions first? We could get reviews out of the way. Yeah, and we almost always so do we can, reviews first, yeah. Okay, let's do that. I'm just going to start picking from the list. When was the last time we did uh, this this would have been the January last ask that answered was January thirtieth. Mm-hmm. Which means okay. we probably recorded it a week before or so. 
Yeah, so I will just kind of start going down the list, and when I see one that, uh, you know, calls to me, we will do that. I'll start with some of the, the most recent ones. This one was from uh, Kira Contrite Spirit and said, This is a really cool pod. Five stars. I listen to a lot of Christian-oriented content, and I come into this podcast with an open mind and heart. I don't come out feeling dirty, which is a common residue in much online content, but inspired. Hmm. I thought this was wonderful, not because of the nice things that were said, but... There's a mystery behind this one. <laughs> yeah. Do you sense that? Do you sense the things not said? The mysteries? I, I almost want to have a conversation with Kira Contrite Spirit for... To, to, it seems like there's some details that are calling to me. The, yeah, are you, yeah. Are you, there read, is, are you getting that read on it? There is some vagueness, that is for sure, which does which does leave you uh, wondering. I think we can generally understand uh, what she's getting at, uh, as far as you know, feeling dirty. Uh, that's, I mean, if if there's well, some that's... Christian content out there that you know, and whatever you, I'm assuming it's kind of that. Uh, that sort of legalistic, maybe, or even the seeker-friendly sort of on the other yeah, side of the thing. That there's lots just of like, ways yeah, bad for taste online, in your mouth. online Christian content to just make you feel weird and gross. Um, not, not that I have any particular one in mind, but I understand the feeling, <laughs> the emotion. So yeah. thank you very much, Kira. That's very nice of you to say, and I hope you um, continue to enjoy the show. Yeah, send us an email and explain yourself. Explain yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's another one. Uh, and I, I, I like the title of this one is what's calling out to me now. This is from Johnny the Bravo F. Five stars, best underrated podcast. And it goes like this. Holy moly. This podcast will take you to different places. The guests will challenge your worldview in a good way, which will, will allow you to see things in a different perspective. The latest episodes are great, featuring Basil and Dr. Chris participating in battle rap, as well as how interior design is tied into uh, creation or the creation of the Garden of Eden. Um, sounds like Johnny the Bravo F was really listening, listening, you know, capital L, yeah. listening, which I appreciate. Um, but yeah, best underrated podcast. I, you know, it's better to be underrated than overrated, Chris. <laughs> I agree. I'll tell, I'll tell you what. I agree. G given a chance to be under or overrated, I would much rather be underrated. Although you, we might make more money if we we're overrated. Um, but we wouldn't feel so good about it. <laughs> no, we would feel dirty. This would yeah. put us into the territory. Exactly. Of oh my about. gosh. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. It's all tying together. Um, so thank you very much, Johnny the Bravo. F. Is it Joni? It might be Joni. It could be Joni, but you know Johnny Bravo. Oh, Johnny. Oh, Bravo. Yeah. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. then I understand. I would feel, I don't know. You're probably right. I mean, I don't know. I don't know for sure. But when I see the Johnny and Bravo together, I was thinking Johnny <laughs> You're the Bravo. You're taking right back to Cartoon Network from 20 years ago. It could be J-O-N-N-I-E. Hey, yeah. Okay. Anyway. N next up. And this is kind of, um, there's a theme here, which I appreciate. This one is from Frugal Brutal, five stars, thought-provoking Christian conversations. God forgive me, but a challenge I have is that I find the discussion and presentation of your average church and most of their bodies to not be fulfilling in an intellectual way. Thank God I found Ravel by way of Canary Cry News Talk. Shout out to the Canarians. Thanks to hosts Basil and Dr. Chris. I love how everybody's calling you Dr. Chris. Their respect is what it is. <laughs> I get Christian, I get Christian conversa conversations and topics that are stimulating and have me actively thinking on topics of faith. This seems unimportant, and in the face of faith, perhaps it is. However, 
My spirit is filled with joy, as if finally getting something it wants, while the corporeal brain reflects and expands on the topics and conversation had on Ravel. I take notes of other media mentioned so I can pursue consuming that as well. To me, it's the difference between having faith and being excited by it. Godspeed, Ravel, and God bless us all. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you, Frugal Brutal. Yeah. My goodness. Um, first of all, the uh, the 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 uh, the uh, what is the theme, the theme of like uh, you know sometimes, sometimes not all sort of Christian content hits the mark. And it, again, we're not thinking of anybody in particular, um, but it's I really consider it a, a high compliment um, to be considered, you know. A good piece of Christian content. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That this is. I mean, this is really wonderful. I was uh, the the line there. Um, my spirit is filled with joy, uh, mm -hmm. as if finally getting something it wants. Mm. <laughs> it's uh, you know to to think that there is um, some kind, and of course that we we can't take uh, credit for that ourselves. We we trust and believe that as believers, if something like that is taking place, it is the ministry of the Holy Spirit, but that is uh, what we do as teachers, as preachers, as podcasters, as people who are communicating the truths of God, that there is um, fellowship that is taking place with the Spirit, and that's kind of what uh, I got here. And then at the end, um, you know, the same sort of, to me, uh, it's a difference between having faith and being excited by it. And that's, I mean, that's so wonderful. That's what you want to hear as any kind of communicator. If, you know, people are excited about the things that you're talking about, and not, again, not because anything about us, we're wonderful or special, but because God is wonderful well, and special. The Bible is. Um, and We're uh, also wonderful and special, Chris. <laughs> yeah, well, we it's are. Okay. In, I can, in, uh, I can I mean, say that. We all are uh, wonderful and special, but that is that is really cool to know, just to know that someone is having uh, that experience. So it was a you, holistic, Brugal Brugal. holistic experience here. The mind and the spirit, the intellect and the faith uh, being fed at the same time is uh, wonderful, wonderful to yeah. hear. Thank you for being Absolutely. Brutal. You know, I'm so tempted. Okay, here's the thing, folks. I do want to say so many of these are great, and I can. it's really hard to on the fly um, pick them. I, I think I've said it before. I apologize. We can't read all of them, um, but, you know, we'll have more in the future. We can go, we can go back. Um, but along the same lines, Overcomer Through Christ, five stars, all that is missing in churchianity today. Ravel podcasts are brilliantly insightful, intellectually stimulating, spiritually encouraging, refreshing breezes of truth, compels one to a closer walk with our Lord and Savior. So I'm truly grateful for these gentlemen's uh, ministry. Yeah. Thank you, mm. Overcomer Through Christ. Man. Again, that holistic experience it was always what we were shooting for, Chris. And to hear that people are getting it uh, is incredible. And yeah, again, absolutely. yeah, you know, this is... This is I don't know. I should, probably shouldn't take too much joy in being sort of juxtaposed against uh, more of a Christian mass media type of thing. Um, but it's, you know, I've always been a little bit of an underdog. And Chris, I think you can, um, I think you can relate to that. And Ravel, this podcast, I think I kind of consider a bit of an underdog as well <laughs> for a number mm -hmm. of reasons. Um and certainly not the most accessible set of um, themes and ideas and conversations and, and uh, uh, competitions of perspectives, uh, both to sort of the secular world and to the general mass churchianity type of thing. We've certainly gotten our share of criticism from that crowd, um, but to hear that there are people somewhere in the middle who appreciate what we're doing is um, very important to me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna zoom down a little bit because uh, I'm just going in order, and I need to try to avoid that. <laughs> Although I really could just go in order. These are just incredible. Um. Oh my gosh. Along the same lines. Okay. This is the last one I'm gonna do on this theme. This is by Jay Good. I see. I see. L eighty. 
Five stars. Amazing Christian discussions. Hard to find Christian anything these days, let alone one I enjoy. These two dive deep into the biblical and into subjects surrounding real life and offer different perspectives because both guys have different personalities. Wow. Somebody can tell us apart, Chris. Can you imagine? (laughs) I look forward to my weekly revel. Thank you, Jay. Good. Uh, Anything to say about that? So stall while I find another one. (laughs) No, I just like that, uh, you know, despite our attempts to, you know, associate ourselves with all of these heathens and heretics um, and to touch on all of these uh, different you know, somewhat controversial issues, people are, we're still, it seems that people are still uh, seeing us as coming through as having a very solid uh, biblical foundation um, and being still uh, Christian, which I, which I really appreciate. Um, It is challenging for me. Sometimes I find myself in some of these conversations really having to kind of bite my tongue and not, you know, turn our segment with a guest into a debate that they weren't, you know, expecting mm. to have. Uh, so mm-hmm. it's it's nice to know that, you know, even though uh, some of the things that are being presented in the show, even as the disclaimer at the beginning uh, mentions, we don't necessarily fully endorse that people are still understanding that uh, we do, you know, have pretty <laughs> mainline conservative evangelical views and that those are still being kind of communicated clearly through the show. So I really appreciate that uh, there, Jay Good. Icicle. Yes. One <laughs> last one. Uh, because I must, you know, I, I, this is not an invitation to contrive a negative review, anyone, but I am happy to, to pronounce that, uh, no negative reviews since the last time we did this, Mm. which is wonderful. Um, so I'll end with one, uh, nice one at the end here. This is from Gailey Mack, five stars. Tell me more. Gailey Mack says, Hola, mi hermanos Dolce. Finding a Christian discussion that will go as deep as you two is an answer to my prayer. There is so much mystery in the Bible that I want to understand better, and y'all are bringing it to the surface. Thank you, CCNT producer Gail M. X, 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 O, 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 O. Thank you very much, Gail. And yes, Gail is a longtime friend and producer of uh, my work. And so I appreciate, I got to give a shout out to Gail. Thank you very much. Yes, we do appreciate the crossover mm-hmm. listeners. Thank you so Indeed. much. They are in full force over here. So mm-hmm. thank you all. Um, yep. And uh, there we go. I'm going to wrap up the reviews there. That was even more than I was planning on. And I hope that it's not bugging anybody. Uh, well, but it's I, just. I liked, I liked one more though. Loving Yahweh. Oh, okay. A yeah, cool kid yeah. and a Bible yeah. geek link up and talk about <laughs> Jesus stuff. Hmm. I guess who's, I, yeah. who's the cool kid and who's the Bible geek, Chris? That's kind of kind of hurtful. Uh, I want to hear you say it. <laughs> You're the cool kid. Yes, it's and pretty. You're the Bible geek. Says, those are this is those good, are yeah. both cool though. Yeah, yeah it's I'm it's pretty it. d- it's pretty dope. Keep pumping out the content, my dudes. Thank you very much, loving Yahweh. Okay, yeah. we did Thank it. Thank you guys so much for those. Keep them, keep them coming in. Um, yes, because it helps all the stuff, right? The bots and how do you say it? Yeah, that's a good, that's, thank you for reminding me to give the pitch, which is, um, you know, especially for a newer podcast like ours, we're still incredibly young, uh, even though we're 31 now, still a child, like all millennials at 31. Um, we, it's super, super, my goodness, super helpful uh, to have these ratings and reviews come in because, you know, A, human beings can read them and be like, oh, this sounds like a cool podcast. I'm going to listen to this. Um, But also, and perhaps even more so, the robots uh, that control our lives and information flow nowadays, uh, they base all these suggestions to people for new podcasts. A lot of that is based on the ratings and reviews. So when we get a bunch of reviews and they're good reviews and they're five stars and they're thoughtful, the robots see that. 
the and the algorithms start popping it into other people's you know suggestions and timelines and things like that um and it really helps new people find the show which uh is good for us and i think is good for them uh, so the way I like to think of it is it's a super easy way to help the show out in a way that we cannot help ourselves out. We cannot leave our own reviews and, you know, kind of do the work to get that benefit. It is all from the kindness and the generosity of time and spirit of the reviewers. So if you haven't done it yet, please leave a rating and a review. Um, you got to do both. That's the way to do it. A rating is words. and the No, nope, the rating is stars. And the review is words. And both are very helpful. Um, and, uh, yeah, and perhaps we will read your rating and review uh, on one of our next Ants Asked and Not Answered. Ants. One of our Ants episodes. Do you think we could do a thing about ants in the Bible? Uh, you think there's yeah, spiritual there lessons? Is, there is actually um, some. Not ants, uh, spiders. Uh, talks mm. about, you know, uh -huh. um, the spiders. There's even, even in the king's palace are there, I guess you could say insects, you know, something like that. There's yeah, something, yeah. something to be uh, we'll learned an, there for sure. Entomology episode. The theology of bugs. Yes. I love it. I love Gross. It. Okay. There we go. Thank you for the reviews. Please leave more. It means a lot. Um, and with that, is it time to talk about some some questions? Is it time to not answer some questions? I think it is. I'm going to try really okay. hard to answer questions this time. But yes. We do, tr we do try <laughs> very hard. That is true. Nobody can say we don't try. It's, yes. Oops. I just messed up our document here. Uh oh, how do I, I fix this? There we go. Fixed it. Mm, good. A little little peek behind the curtain there, folks. We're sharing a document. All right. You want to read this? Or do I read this? Um you just have been I so mean, long you always since we've done get, one of these. You always get complimented on your, you know, voice. So I, I do like figure, reading. I just figure you should somebody do needs it. to somebody needs to write a book that I can do the audio book on. Have I? Uh, never mind. Okay. <laughs> I'll so think about I'm, it when mine comes out. Ooh, yes. <laughs> I was trying to think of a funny name of a book that you would write, but I can't think of it. Uh, d being a Daddies, Babies, and Baby Daddies by Dr. Christopher Ryan Gates. All right. <laughs> this question. These are questions that were sent into our email or sent to us over uh, social media. Uh, things like that. So if you ever have any questions, uh, you feel free to do so because um, we want them. It's content, baby. It's not just, you're not imposing. We need it. So uh, even if it's not about anything we've talked about, if you have a burning question you'd like to hear us just sort of pontificate on, uh, you've got a cool kid and a Bible geek who are ready. This one comes from Mike. No location. No identifying factors, just Mike. And he says this, Hello, chaps. Riveting podcast, I must say. Quite exquisite, marvelously so, indeed. Oh, I feel like I need to put a accent on that. Hello, chaps. Riveting podcast, I must say. Quite exquisite and marvelously so, indeed. On the real. Okay, get real, Chris. <laughs> On the real, I do enjoy the format and the conversations, and I just want to say, keep up the good work. I was inspired by Basil reading about the Proverbs 31 woman in the KJV on the Matriarchy episode. Inspired to reach out and ask if you gents would want to do a conversation about the Bible version issue and textual criticism. I know I wouldn't agree at all being a TR KJV guy, but I am fascinated anytime I hear my favorite podcasters discuss it, especially those who studied the subject in college. All I ask is that you please don't call us all fundies and ruckmanites. I have no idea what that, <laughs> those words mean, but I promise I will not call you those things. But you guys have a good record of being respectful all the time, which I greatly appreciate. So I'm not worried. God bless. Okay, well, thank you, Mike. 
And uh, Chris, I want to pose this question first to you. Uh, would you like to have a discussion about the Bible version issue and textual criticism? This is sort of your whole thing. Yeah, um, kind of, sort of, my whole thing, yes. Uh, textual criticism is a specific discipline all unto itself, which uh, if the folks aren't familiar, textual criticism is the uh, particular discipline uh, whereby scholars look at the actual manuscript evidence that we have of the biblical text. Of course, none of those being original. Um, we don't have any original documents, but we have a long, long transmission history of the biblical text. There's somewhere around, depending on who's doing the counting or whatever and how you're counting the fragments and the pieces and things like that, somewhere around 5,700 uh, manuscripts that we have just of the just of the New Testament um, that we basically can trace the transmission history and things like that. And textual criticism is the um, kind of discipline whereby scholars look at those manuscripts. They see how um, the the information was passed along. They do their best to date those manuscripts, see which ones were earlier, which ones were later. They look for any variants that are going to come up between any of the manuscripts. Um, and then interesting little details that can be kind of drawn from looking at the actual manuscripts themselves. So uh, I did well, take real a quick, but yep. may okay. I comment? Okay. Sure, so I yeah. know you, you took a course. I heard you there and I would have been surprised if you didn't. Yeah. Um, is this different? So first of all, I thought we did have some originals. You're telling me that we have zero originals. Zero. I mean, I guess if we had originals, they would be somehow sort of looted and stored in a dungeon beneath the Vatican, probably. Yeah. If they if originals did exist, they would not necessarily be floating around as some sort of uh, acad in some sort of academically accessible way. That yeah. seems like something, you know, there would be some Nicolas Cage sneaking through the catacombs, <laughs> yeah. avoiding the Vatican guards yeah. with Uzis and things like that. Yeah. So that well, makes the sense. thing with original documents too is that most of the New Testament texts, in particular, um, and of course, when you get into the Old Testament, it's a whole different, whole different story there. But with the New Testament text, most of those, uh, the original manuscripts would have been, you know, their letters or some of them even encyclicals, where you have an original, but it's it's written and then it's presented to a church, and you usually have a single person who's going to stand up there and read it. But what happens is you have copyists who immediately because they don't have ways to save data, you know, like we do now, they would immediately begin to make copies of these things, and then there would be copies made and copies made, and that's the only way that you can kind of pass it along to people. Um, and the thing with written data is when it comes to archaeology, one of the most rare finds in archaeology is written data. I mean, unless you're having mm. it inscribed, like when you go into Egypt and things like that, and you have inscriptions in stone um, and those hieroglyphs and those sorts of things, to find paper, you know, uh, papyrus and even leather uh, that they used to write on that has, you know, survived uh, the test of time and all the weather and every other fires and all kinds of other things that might happen throughout history. It's extremely rare. It's one of the reasons that the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, there in 1947, 48, when they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's probably, it may be the, uh, the greatest archaeological discovery ever, some people would say, because we found these scrolls that had been preserved for somewhere around 2,000 years, uh, some of them in incredible condition. And one of the things, too, talking about transmission history, and this will all come back around as we get back to the question, but what they found was we, we, we have these scrolls that are 2,000 years old, and we can compare those 2,000-year-old scrolls with the texts that we have right now, and per those all being Old Testament texts, uh, those written by the Essenes who were out there in Qumran, the sectarians, you know, during the time of Jesus, and they were probably all killed, you know, around 70 um, when when Rome went through and just annihilated all of the Jews. Um, but so they're, they're dated somewhere around there. But what we find is there is 
almost no discrepancy between the scrolls that we found uh, at Qumran and the biblical text that we had in the 1940s. Uh, they can compare those. This is what we have right now is a biblical text. Oh, wow, this matches up almost perfectly with what we had from 2,000 years ago that these guys wrote. So what it tells us is that the transmission history of the Bible is actually extremely uh, reliable when we're looking at uh, the textual evidence there. So textual criticism is going to deal with all of these different sorts of issues. So just as a brief sort of synopsis of, of what it is, that's kind of textual criticism in a nutshell. And that okay. is sort of a foundation for biblical versions. So we can get yeah, into, so it's that's more... kind of really the heart of his question, is the, the English versions of the Bible. Yeah, so the textual criticism thing is more of a, it's almost more of like a archaeological uh, physically the physical manuscripts and the uh, uh, I don't know not criticism but the um, mm, categorization of, of evidence you know in yeah, sort of a, exactly, a yeah. hard scholarly way evidence of yes, the forensic yeah not tr where, whereas um, translation is a little bit more there's a lot wrapped up in there you know you got language you got culture you've got the, the changing definitions of words you've got things like that yeah yeah okay so yeah it's uh that's sexual criticism just in case anybody heard that and they didn't know you know exactly what mike was was asking about but it's a whole discipline unto itself one of my my uh the second on my dissertation committee dr bill warren up there at new orleans um is he loves textual criticism <laughs> he geeks out on it it's one of his favorite things i took his course um, and it was it was super fun. You get to look at these images. We had the opportunity if we wanted to travel overseas um, to a couple different institutions over there to actually handle some of the some of the documents. I have not handled any of them. I was not uh, that into it that I wanted to go do that. They do offer a trip to the school, but I didn't go on that one. But if you go to Israel, they have um, a you know museum kind of of the Bible over there, and they have actually Old Testament. Uh, manuscripts that are on display there and you can go look at them they're behind glass and they're in these you know temperature controlled rooms and the humidity is all perfect and the light is all perfect and everything and you can walk around and look at them and if you have never seen them it's one thing to look at a picture which was what we did in the TC class you just had high resolution pictures of the scrolls and we would go through and we would collate and translate um, you know from these original manuscripts uh, but to actually go look at them with your eyes and to know that you're looking at manuscripts that are 2,000 or more years old and to see how like perfectly they're written um they're, like the, the letters I don't know about you but if I ever write on a piece of paper and there's no lines on it my my writing always tends to kind of curve down towards the end of the line like all the time and my, my yeah. letters kind of get out of you know out of shape they're all like perfect it looks like someone did it with a typewriter but this was done by a scribe you know with a with a quill you know an ink and and writing on this papyrus which is not the smoothest surface either to be writing on and it's just it's extremely Extremely fascinating. So I understand why people geek out on it. It's not my favorite, uh, you know, topic to, to study, but it is very interesting. It's very important, and we very much appreciate the people who do it and gather all the data and then tell us what we need to know about it. So anyway, that's all I have to say right now about TC. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that has to do with he's asking about Bible versions. So the, the real question that he's getting at is, you know, w English versions of the Bible and their reliability. Um, and he seems to be he's, he identifies himself as a TRKJV. That's somebody who relies on the King James Version uh, drawn from the Textus Receptus, which is a older uh, Greek manuscript of the Bible uh, put together by Erasmus, um, and it is the, the translation derives, uh, I think, predominantly um, um, from that. So that's what he's saying. He is one of these KJV guys. That's why he says, please don't call me a fundy, a fundamentalist, or a Ruckmanite. And the, the Ruckmanite thing has to do with uh, a scholar from back in the early 19... Hundreds uh, Ruckman, who was one of the first proponents of the KJV 
only like he believed that I believe went so far as even to say that the, it was like an inspired English version of the Bible, which we're going to say the only inspired biblical texts are those <laughs> that are original uh, sorts of manuscripts. And it's really hard when you start, and this is all part of the conversation, it's hard when you start moving from one language to another. Because if you know anybody who's multilingual, if you know anybody in your life, or if you, listener out there, are multilingual, bilingual, trilingual, however many linguals you might be, uh, you know that when it comes to translation issues, there's always going to be difficulty. I have... Uh, Many friends who speak Spanish, not uncommon here in the United States of America, particularly not here in Florida. Uh, there's a big uh, Puerto Rican um, contingent down here. I have a very good, dear friend of mine, uh, Roberto. What's up, papi? Uh, Roberto, he's <laughs> Puerto Rican, and uh, he's bilingual, speaks speaks excellent Spanish and excellent English. And every once in a while, you know, I'll ask him about, like, uh, you know, what's this word mean or whatever. And Boricua was one of them, if you've ever heard, you know, some somebody say Boricua and I'm like what does that what does that even mean like I hear you say that sometimes and you joke and you call me a Boricua or whatever and I hear it and I'm like what does that even mean and he sits and thinks for a minute and he's like well it's kind of like it's kind of like a bad boy or like a like a mm. sexy dude or like <laughs> kind of like a playboy or something and I was like okay I was like well what like which one is it which one is which one is it <laughs> most like and then he was like well you don't really have a word in English for it Mm. There's not really an English word, you know, and he's like, that's why we just say Boricua, because there's not really a word in English that encapsulates the whole idea of this, you know, thing, this person, this guy. So in, in language, it's like that a lot. It's like that where we don't, particular languages don't have words that are a one-to-one -one corollary from, you know, the Hebrew into the English or from the Greek into the English. So when you get into translation issues, the difficulties that interpreters have is they come to a particular Greek or Hebrew word and they say there's not actually a word in English that perfectly suits this one. So... Which word are we going to use that's the closest here? And then that's when you start getting different variations. Um, and for the, a long, long time, of course, the KJV uh, was the premier um, and by and large kind of like the only, you know, other than like the, the Tyndale um, Bible previously in, in English that, you know, people would that people would rely on and that they would go to. English-speaking people, it was the KJV. Uh, of course, also written back in the 1600s, and English uh, has evolved as a language uh, substantially since the 1600s. All language always evolves. We see this all over the place. It's like when we're doing, actually, very interestingly, Hebrew has kind of survived the test of time. And Hebrew... Uh, if you take, you know, a Hebrew class in seminary or something like that, you learn Hebrew, you go to Israel, it's it's very, very similar to uh, the biblical text, the biblical Hebrew that you're reading. Whereas, like in a Greek class, so I studied Koine Greek, I had a chance to go over to Greece, and it's almost like an entirely different language. The, the biblical Greek is almost entirely different now from like what you have in modern Greek. Alphabet's still the same, can still read, read words and things like that, but the morphology of words and all of that has changed substantially over time and it is the same way with the English so there are people who still want to you know maintain and preserve this older English version of the Bible the KJV sounds like Mike being one of those people um, but then as language evolves as language progresses and not only as language progresses but as we have made more discoveries and we have more and more manuscripts that we have discovered since the 1600s we have more uh, attestation to the biblical text through the manuscript evidence that we have found we have decided i think that we could possibly do a better job you know in creating a translation of the bible for english speakers that might be a little more shall we call it accurate uh, because English has evolved and we have more manuscript evidence. So we have started moving kind of away from the KJV in a lot of ways. Many people have, uh, I myself have. Um, and 
uh, getting out there into all of these different sorts of English translations of the Bible, and there's, you know, no shortage of them uh, right now. You've run into, we have the NASB, the ESV, the NIV, the NLT, the CSB, uh, the Revised the ABC, Standard, the FBI, ABC. CIA, <laughs> NIH, NSA. Yes. Yeah, all I'm familiar. On and on and on. And, um, People, it just came up actually um, in my church here recently, and one of the one of the ladies there in the church was asking me. She said, "Do I have a good translation of the Bible here?" And this, I think, is kind of really the question that Mike is asking about English translations. And it's kind of what I it's kind of what I tell everybody all the time when it comes to English translations. If you have one of the one of those premier sorts of English translations. There's a bunch of them. There's probably a hundred of them out there. I don't know how many English translations there are, but those ones that, you know, kind of everybody's heard of that are, you see people using, you know, NASB, uh, ESV, NIV, NKJV, KJV, any of those. If you have any of those, you have a good translation of the Bible. You have a good one. Well, I have a question. Because when you say good, what does that mean? Is that a subjective thing or is there, yeah. um, you know, it, a set of standards? Yeah. Yeah. That, a lot of people, you know, ha- there's, a, there's a whole mindset of the quality of the Bible for some people in some, uh, you know, traditions, per- I, probably mostly sort of liberal traditions. I don't mean that politically. I just mean those who are willing to have a little bit more space to wiggle around in their theology. Mm-hmm. I mean, there some people, and I was surprised to learn this, really, really appreciate the message yeah and uh (laughs) similar ones so i don't want you to talk about that yet because i know you'll get there but when you say something is really really good what is the standard by which you're measuring that yeah so when i it's a it's a great question um always want to you know clarify terms in discussion and and when i say good uh thank you for making me explain it what i mean is it is communicating accurately the message of (laughs) the text of scripture they are the message or or the like the technical words yeah so that is where you know a distinguishment um is going to come in too because you're going to have um some translations in most most Bible translations. If you don't know this, dear listener, uh, if you have a whatever version of the Bible you have, if you open up to the very first couple of pages, they will usually have a description there about um, what their methodology was in their interpretive process. So they're going to tell you, kind of, you know, specifically what it was, what feeling kind of they were trying to to communicate in this particular interpretation and you basically have on a on a sliding scale you have like a word for word sort of translation where they're going to do their best to give you uh, and again if you remember I don't like to use literal but more a wooden sort of translation like this is what the Hebrew word means like in Hebrew, this is how we would say it in English, and you have a word for word, and so they try to preserve each and every word as closely as they can. And then on the other side of the scale, you have more of like a thought for thought. So that's like here on, on one side, and, and the word for word is going to be like your NASB, your ESV, those sorts of things uh, are going to be like a word for word. More more rigid, more wooden. They don't really read real smooth to, to the reader, but they're going to say, but these are the words that are being used here in Greek, or these are the words that are being used in Hebrew. Whereas if you move over kind of to the other side of the scale, you're going to have something more like the NIV or even the NLT, where it's going to be like, this is more of a thought for thought. In Hebrew, the thing that is being communicated, we would say it like this in English. We're not going to use necessarily the same words uh, that they use, but we're going to communicate the same sort of thought. And this is always uh, the case study that I use, and I just pulled up my uh, 
PowerPoint presentation from my hermeneutics class because uh, this is a perfect example of it. So in John, in John chapter 2, um, and I think we actually talked about this uh, here on the on the show, but it's been some time and I can't remember, so maybe the listeners can't remember uh, either. But in John chapter 2, you have that uh, it's the story of when Jesus turns water into wine, um, and it, it goes on the third day, a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee, Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had been invited to the wedding. Uh, when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. And then in chapter 2, verse 4, woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour is not yet come. So in the Greek, when you read this in the Greek, it is actually what he says is, woman, <laughs> and Jesus says, what to me and to you are the Greek words. So if you want to do a word-for-word -word translation from the Greek into the English, and if you're trying to be just very precise and deliberate in, in your translation, then you would say, and Jesus said, woman, what to me and to you? And mm, then, mm -hmm. of course, your reader is like, well, what the heck does that mean? So right. he's using a, you know, colloquialism. So then the question is to the interpreter there or the translator, do we use the exact words here that Jesus said, or do we kind of help the reader out in understanding what it was Jesus said? And then, of course, you have all the different English translations that get translated all kinds of different ways. And what you kind of have to do is figure out what is this text kind of trying to communicate and how can we help an English reader or listener understand it? And that is the problem that uh, interpreters and translators run into. And this is where people start to quibble about who does it the best. And then that just depends on what do you want? Do you want something that's more rigid and word for word? Or do you want something that's kind of communicating the actual message, and this is what I always tell everybody when it comes to these English translations, when I say they're all good, what I mean is they're faithfully communicating the important matters of our Christian faith. Uh, I, I believe that they're communicating them accurately, most of those mainline sorts of translations. And then the thing to me is, when you're reading them, which one of them resonates with your heart the most? And this is something, too, that when you have people who are bilingual and trilingual and things like that, sometimes maybe you've been in a prayer meeting with somebody or something like that, and there's, you know, maybe uh, somebody whose Spanish is their first language, and they start to pray, and they kind of just can't help it, and they just start praying in Spanish, even though everybody who's standing around speaks English, and nobody knows exactly what they're saying, but they have this heart language, right? So there's the language yeah. of their heart, the one that comes out when they want to express themselves. In the same way, there is a resonance that takes place with the English text of Scripture, and I think that it's just important for people as they're trying to choose which one, that you choose one, that as you're reading it, it, it sounds natural to you, it feels natural to you, and it really resonates with your heart. And I am not a proponent for any one particular uh, translation of the Bible. I really love the NIV. For me, it's the one I cut my teeth on as a young, uh, young man. It was the 1984 translation, and they recently, in 2011, changed it, and I got kind of upset. But actually, they made a lot of uh, good changes, and it's it's a better translation now in 2011, even though some of the verses that I know and have memorized, I'm like, oh, man, this isn't what it says anymore. But I go back and look at kind of the, why did they change it like this? And it's, oh, well, they actually got it a little bit better here, it seems. So... Now, if if I may, for a second. Yes, of there. course. Yes, I'm out of breath. So go Old ahead. Oh, fast man. Yeah, I'll let you get your breath there. Let your heart rate uh, calm down a little bit. So uh, if I can sort of maybe put it into different words, part of what you're talking about seems to be, uh, it can be described as form almost. Um, and, not, and it could be form of... Uh, language, form of syntax, form of uh, whatever. I don't know. I'm just kind of actually just picking a word to, and hopefully we can get there. Um, and I can see how, first of all, every new translation or every translation, whether it's new or old, can almost be regarded as like a different tool maybe or, or something like that, where they can be effective for different reasons, depending on, you know, the, the, the purpose you are coming at the, the Bible with, which might sound weird, um, maybe to 
uh, most people. But, you know, for I think for you and I, we're, you m more so than I, but I did have quite a bit of biblical uh, education, uh, formal education, which is, you know, if you are perhaps looking for a more colloquial and um, easy, easy reading, or if you're preaching or something like that, uh, depending on the, the, the setting and the set in which you are presenting uh, scripture, it seems like it's something to think about, something to think about, which, which translation will best resonate with um, what and who uh, is in the, I don't know, the, the purpose in the, in the crowd or the audience or whatever. Um, For sure. Not, not that I think that uh, teachers take that much <laughs> like think about it that much, but I could see how they would all have sort of a different use or a different purpose. Um, whereas I would say probably your, your average Bible reader just kind of wants to read the Bible and enjoy it and understand it. And like you said, have it resonate, um, as they read, uh, the words, which mm -hmm. can be an entirely different experience if you're going with KJV or, yeah. you know, NIV even, uh, you don't even have to swing too far the other way to see a big difference. Mm -hmm. Um, I can see how somebody, you know, it, I don't want to get too granular yet. Maybe you had a plan for this, but I could see why people love the KGV so much. Mm -hmm. um, there is, you know, the language in it does sort of inspire um, a reverence almost. Yes. It reflects it reflects the age of yep. of what's being read. It reflects, uh, you know, uh, 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 it's got history in the these and thys and and things like that uh, sort of hearkening back to um, a certain era of christianity an era where suddenly the bible was available uh, broadly and was supported uh, by the government uh, if that's something that appeals to one i could totally see that mm -hmm. but i'm having a hard time understanding why kjv in particular would be considered sort of more true. And maybe I need someone who mm, is, is a big fan of that sort of thing, unless you, unless you know the talking points. Uh, why would KGV be more true or more accurate than perhaps one that was done more recently in history with more sources or more uh, textual criticism or more this or that or an updated sort of lexicon of english words yeah um it's, it, because especially because the sort of opposite um argument perhaps against the kjv is precisely because it was sort of done by the government and harkens to a time when christianity was more of a social control oh, not more of but had been sort of commandeered uh, or pirated to be used as perhaps more of a political control mechanism than um, an earnest connection with our creator. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. So uh, I, I want this, this to, giggle. I, I, this is nervous giggle because he knows that I stumped him. I got him again, folks. <laughs> no, I really want to engage with the uh, with engage. the like socio political sort of aspect engage. of it, but I'm gonna stick with the I'm engage. gonna stick with the reliability um, and accuracy issues. And I have well, had I did, okay. If you, I, I will give you permission to skim uh, whatever category. Of, of, uh, of, of information that needs to be skimmed to help me understand um, the, you know, the, the, the real conversation there. Because honestly, I have not connected very deeply with the KJV, no KJV uh, discussion. Yeah, yeah. So I have had only one um, particular uh, discussion with an individual about it and them trying to, you know, give me an argument. Um, and I have not specifically researched it myself because I don't mean to be disparaging even to like Mike, you know, the person asking the question, but mm -hmm. to me, it's, it's just such a, uh, it, it, the issue is so like 
I could I could take it or leave it. It's like you have got to be kidding me. You can't say that it's the best one. You can say it's the one that you prefer the most, and I and I can make no I can't make any you know gripes about that. But to say it's the most accurate, and we and this is this is one of the things. And this was dropped on me when I was like a teenager in you know uh, at, at church, and I had an NIV Bible. And this older gentleman from the church comes up and he says, "What Bible is that that you have there?" And I say, "Oh, it's like I don't know what it was like the Teen Walk NIV Bible or something. You know, it had like <laughs> splattered." Teen Bible. Yeah, yeah, that one or whatever. I I definitely had that Bible. Yeah, and he was like, "Open, open it up to Acts," you know, and I was like, oh, "Okay." And I don't remember specific chapter and verse. I should have looked it up for the, you know, purpose of this conversation. But he says, "Go to you know whatever it is, Acts six twelve. and I was like, "Oh," and he's like, and "I was like, oh," and it wasn't there. It went from whatever eleven to thirteen, and I was like, mm-hmm. uh, and he's like, "See, your Bible leaves out verses." You use that NIV Bible. And I was like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, though, as I progressed in my faith and in my education, uh, it's not that the NIV leaves that verse out. It's that the KJV actually has it added in. And as mm-hmm. we have gone through and found other manuscripts, what we find is that some of these verses uh, have been added in later. They are scribal editions, uh, kind of editorial remarks that are put in there from time to time. And as we go back and find older copies of these manuscripts, we find this wasn't there. Somewhere along the way, at some point, some copyist thought, my the audience who's listening, who's going to be reading this, the person I'm writing this to, might not understand this because maybe they're not Jews or, you know, whatever the case might be. Maybe or they don't have all of the context. Or they're peasants, their yes. First are, chance at getting a Bible. Yeah, and so they would say, you know, let me explain this, and they'd throw in, you know, an extra verse there of explanation, and that gets added in, and what you find is almost 100% of the time, if there's a discrepancy as to whether or not a verse should be in or out of the text of Scripture, the the error is in the KJV camp and not in some of the more modern Maybe translations. Perhaps you, if we were trying to be political about this you wouldn't say error you would just say the <laughs> the uh, discrepancy yeah would yeah be. so and in addition to i mean i guess that well, lends well, itself it, to the idea that kjv would be an additionally inspired english version i mean that that would be the sort of theological justification for that was yeah that that's it was that added Ruck, because thing he was right it was about. added because god wanted it to be added yeah Yeah, Yeah. so, um, and and that too, that was kind of what I was laughing about when you were talking about the sociopolitical thing, and I was like, it's kind of like, even if some scoundrel, you know, were behind it, or even if people were trying to manipulate people by it, there still, of course, is the possibility that the Lord can superintend it and can have it, you know, communicated and preserved in a way that's still going to honor him, even using, you know, wicked people to do it. And that's, you know, that's gets into what ifs and all kinds of different things. So it's not even kind of really worth are there any Are there any off the top of your head, are there any of those instances where an added um, verse like drastically changes what the point was like, uh, like you know what that, I mean like that that drastically affects the theology of that chapter or whatever yeah almost always not that's that's mm-hmm. the thing that's really cool about it and the people right. who are outside of the Christian community who are going to look in and make that criticism they're like oh well, what about all these variations you have and it's like well let's talk about them most of them are really inconsequential to and that's why I say any one that you have uh, the, the the main points are still being communicated even the KJV. And I think the KJV is wonderful. I'm not trying to be disparaging to Mike, the person asking the question. He seems like a very intelligent person, and I don't think he is a a fundamentalist. I don't think he is narrow-minded in any way, but he probably is aware of this conversation too, and he may even himself know that he doesn't have the most accurate 
English translation, but he has one that is highly revered by a lot of people for all the reasons, Basil, that you mentioned. But in some instances where there are differences, and I wrote my dissertation in Mark, I wrote it particularly on the end of Mark and the interpretation of the conclusion of the Gospel of Mark, and you have actually there at the end of Mark, in verses 9 through 20, they are, the scholarly community is in as much agreement as they can possibly be in, that 9 through 20 are not original to the Gospel of Mark. Those are a later edition. Mark ended his Gospel at 16.8. Of course, it wasn't 16.8 when he wrote it, but in our English translation, as we understand it, it ends at 16.8. 9 through 20 in chapter 16 are not original to the text, and you actually do run into some interesting things there, because that is where he talks about the disciples going out and handling snakes, you know, being being bitten by venomous snakes and not dying and drinking poison and not dying in these sorts of things. And it's kind of like out of place. You don't really see anything like that. It seems like they might be drawing on some of the accounts of Paul in Acts and things like that, but it's definitely not original. So you do have this stuff that's not original. And then you have a whole sect of churches where part of what they do is they pass around venomous snakes. They get in a circle and handle snakes and they drink poison and they think that they're doing that because they're being faithful to the text of Scripture, but in all actuality, that wasn't inspired. That was not mm, Mark didn't like write Sounds like a party that. to me. Yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, you come from a charismatic background. I don't know if you guys ever handled <laughs> snakes. Never <laughs> did do the snake poison. thing, no. <laughs> but that would be one one issue, but most of them, no. The, the one in Acts um, is kind of, people will kind of quibble about that one because... Uh, it's, I believe it's when Philip is is uh, sharing the gospel with someone, and he says uh, there's like an extra, the, the verse that gets added in there, which is taken out of some Bibles, is like, uh, repent and be baptized, you know, and be saved or something. And it's like, well, that was taken out because that wasn't originally in there. And people are like, see, they don't want you to repent and be baptized and saved. And it's like, dude, there's 20 other places in the NIV that says you have to repent and be baptized and get saved. Right. Like, yeah. it's not in here because it wasn't original. So it's no, easier I'm... to complain, much like when, I mean, it's like the more granular you get on comparing you know, things, whether you do verse by verse or word by word or whatever, uh, it's easier to point out the differences and discrepancies between the Bible versions. Um, but it kind of seems like the more you pull out, the more aligned the broad theology is. I mean, there's not like mm -hmm. any huge discrepancies in the in the broad theology between translations right yeah absolutely yeah. it's absolutely. not like the conditions for salvation or the whatever change from one translation to another yeah the one that i would caution on just a little bit is uh -oh. is the message and that's uh -oh. not because and this Watch is just out, my own message personal, heads this is just my own personal kind of take on it but there are a few places um in the message where in there so that one they're going to call you have word for word and then a thought for thought that one's going to be like a paraphrase so that one uh they don't even have chapter and verse marked off in the message they actually have it you know it'll be like whatever chapter two and then it's like verses you know whatever one through ten and then they'll just have this big paragraph and it's kind of written as a stream of thought so it's almost like you don't know where you know, a verse starts or ends or a thought starts or ends. So it's almost sometimes hard to even figure out like what verse is this that is being translated here. The thing that is really cool about it is it focuses on that heart language aspect that we were talking about. And in a very real sense, a modern person, you know, particularly whatever teenager, you know, in this day and age, well, I don't know, they have their whole own language now that's, you know, <laughs> happened maybe back when you and I were Jesus teenagers. Jesus is lit, fam. Yeah, yeah, but that's almost what they do, and there is a sense, it's a cool sort of presentation of the text, but every once in a while, there are some important, I think, theological uh, matters that get muddied in the midst of their trying to be culturally relevant. Uh, sometimes I think there's some theology, So, but I don't know too many people that are using the message as like, this is my Bible. Like, this is the one I like. Most people the, go to it and kind of like, I wonder w how they interpreted this and translated this. And a lot of times it is really cool. And you read it and it's like, wow, that's beautiful and kind of poetic. But don't, you know, 
base your theology right. not necessarily off of it. That's my only caution. The message, more like the massaging theology, <laughs> right, Chris? Yes, for right? the seeker, for the seeker friendly. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, I can't remember what it was. I I really haven't read the message very much, but I remember <laughs> I remember reading one passage. I cannot remember what it was. It was uh, it was something to the effect of like, and Jesus cast them out and told the and you know then there's a quote of like get out of here you sin against my father and da 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 right. It's a very very biblical sounding event. And the message version was like, and Jesus said, get on out of here. You hear? I'm, I'm tired of you. I'm like, wow, that is powerful. Yeah. I yeah. would much rather the KGV where he's, uh, I don't know. Um, wow. Yeah. Okay. So we are spending a lot of time on this, which I am enjoying very much. But I want to make sure that you have the time to to make sure to fit in one more question. Uh, yeah. So how far are we in <laughs> to completely not answering this question? Uh, I mean, pretty pretty far. There's a couple other there's a couple other okay. things I had thought about possibly bringing up, but I think we'll just round it out by again, uh, just kind of. I think I think the question really was talk about, you know, textual criticism and English translations of the Bible. And if you're asking me, Mike, uh, you know, my personal take on it, it is that most of your mainline English translations of the Bible, I think, are reliable. I think that they are accurate within, you know, a degree of whatever sort of discrepancy that I'm personally not going to <laughs> tell somebody that they have the wrong Bible or whatever. And again, it comes down to, man, which one of these is it going to be the easiest for you to read? And is it for, and is it going to be the most meaningful? And like you said, for some people, they came up on the KJV, and that is the one. I knew a guy, a, a wonderful old man who prayed uh, at our church years ago, and every time he prayed, he prayed in KJV English. You'd talk mm, to him, and he'd yeah. be like, how you doing, young man? Great to see you here today at church. God bless you, son. I love you. And then he'd get up to pray you know, for the offering or something, and he'd be like, uh, oh Lord, our, thy father, whatever. And I'm trying to do it, but, and he, <laughs> yeah. thou, thou lovest us and all. And I'm like, dude, but like for him, that was, it was important. And, and he was being reverential in that. So I'm not going to look at yeah. anybody and be like, that's ridiculous. Why would you do that? Because for him, that was kind of his heart language in communicating with the Lord. Cause that was what he had cut his teeth on. Uh, in reading yeah. his Bible and those sorts of things. So, I mean, not going to lie, there is something about the KGV that demands sort of uh, a, a shift in reverence yeah. and a, a, an attention. I mean, it's almost so hard to read sometimes, especially if you're, I just mean like reading out loud, like physically moving your mouth in yeah. the way that it needs to go to pronunciate uh, what's going on in there. It's, it's uh, demands full attention because you cannot, if your mind starts to wander, it'll get all jumbly in there mm -hmm. <laughs> trying to sort of passively uh, take that language in. So I do appreciate it for that. It does demand the attention that uh, you'd say is required to, um, you know, intentionally and uh, uh, absorb what's going on in there. Yeah. I do Can we talk wish... about the extreme? Can we... I, yes. I do just wish that that people would not, and this may be where you were going. I wish that uh -oh. people wouldn't uh, say this is this is the best one, or this is oh, the yeah. only one, or this is the one you should be using. I, you know, I if you prefer the KJV and you attend a church that's KJV only or whatever, and that's what your church has decided, I'm totally cool with that. I think that's great. I think that there are people who want that, who desire that, and that's totally cool. But Please don't fall into the trap of being at a church like that or, or thinking like that and looking around at everybody else and being like, you don't have a real Bible. You know, we yeah, have, it's another... like, you don't have the real Bible either, my friend. <laughs> Unless you want to go study yeah. some Hebrew and some Greek, you don't, you don't have the real Bible there either. The, the King another James point. Version is no more inspired than 
the NIV. Like it's just point not. of another point of uh, you know failure for unity in the body, or another point of um, division that probably is not the most essential to the broad mission of salvation. Yeah. Um, except for I will I will need to disagree with you because I do think there is a best version of the Bible, and that is the extreme teen Bible. Um, you know, I if we could just find a church, Lord God, please bring me to a church that that sticks to your true and inspired word, the extreme teen Bible. That it, was the uh, one that had the little inserts on, like, uh, yes, sexual purity and stuff like that, yeah, right? Huh? It'll be <laughs> like, you know, stuff. for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him and all not perish but have everlasting life. And then next to that is, like, a box, like a cutout insert, like you said. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> Jesus wants you to do your homework, kids. Make sure to listen <laughs> to your teachers. That's what's going on here. Is <laughs> It just had, like, it's a parallel... Like a uh, 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 youth pastor wearing a backwards hat who turns a folding chair backwards and straddles it. <laughs> and, you know, is here to really make sure you understand <laughs> what it's trying to say. And the, uh, the cover of it was fantastic. Oh, my God. I got to Google this right I now. Th- I think I it still was, have mine somewhere. It was kind of like a... You know, it came out. We need to get the info. What is the bibliography? It was like in the early 90s. I'm going to say 92. Do you think it was bro. early 90s? If I I'm guessing, I'm saying later. 92. Oh, there it is. Beautiful. And it has... So on the cover, folks, it is just uh, an exquisite... Uh, <laughs> I mean, coming <laughs> off of the art series, this is an exquisite sort of inspired um, visual. It says right in the middle with this crazy multicolored serif font that has like four different sizes of letters. Extreme Teen Bible. And at the top, it says, no fears, no regrets, (laughs) just a future with promise. This is the cover of the Holy Bible, which is awesome and was inspiring. I I read this sucker for so long. Uh, okay, let's see when it came out. I'm going to guess. Bef- oh, there's so many different versions, too. I'm going to guess, I would guess 98. Because I think the thing with it was that it was, like, it was a little bit too early 90s for how late in the 90s it actually was. Yeah. When did I the actually dream? I as I as I just did my own performed my own Google search here too. I do remember the extreme teen. I did not have that one though. I had the Zondervan oh. Teen Study Bible, which actually came out in ninety three, so I was pretty close with my oh. guess of ninety two. But I had the Zondervan teen, teen Study Bible. There it is. Study that's the one with the paint splashes all over the front. Oh yes. That was the one okay. I had. So this is the one that my church had, you know, two dozen of them in stacks by the door of the youth group. This is the one we actually used in youth group, just to yeah. make sure everybody was using Man, the same. Version. I loved I, looking at it. It's like I'm, I'm feeling, I'm feeling this like rush of nostalgia, and like my heart is almost being warmed by just seeing the cover of it. Wow. Uh, yeah. See, so this strange. is speaking. Is this speaking your heart language? It is, yeah. Yes, it definitely is. Oh my gosh. Is. The Extreme Teen Bible. Bro, you at can least this buy these still. I'm ordering one on Amazon 19, right now. <laughs> October 10th, 1999, baby. Dude, it's only off. $12 on Amazon. We should start another podcast. No. <laughs> okay, we can't do that. But what we will do is I think... We should have a recurring episode type. You know, we've got our Ask and Not Answers. We've got our Bible study with Dr. Chris. We've got our, uh, 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 whatever, in interview ones. We've got our series. I think occasionally we should do a extreme teen Bible <laughs> uh, Bible study. I'm down. I mean, <laughs> here's do the it. thing, man. 
to to have a successful podcast Here's the thing, these bro. days, you got to remember to you know make content for the young people because the young people are where the that sweet sweet podcasting money is. <laughs> <laughs> right on. I think it would be fun. We could put some, you know, '90s music in there or something, and use words like radical yeah. and yeah. And we will. Nobody will be able to tell, but we will wear backwards hats and straddle mm-hmm. a backwards uh, folding chair. Fanny packs, I think, were in vogue at that time too. Actually, mm, so I'm yeah. I don't know. I'll have to check the records on that. But spiritually. Yes, spiritually, a spiritual fanny pack is definitely a cool thing for a youth pastor to have. Okay, hold on. Just going to check Amazon real quick. Um, and while I do this, yeah, are you finished? Are you are, are you I'm are done. You done? Are we <laughs> finished? I hope yes. I hope that was wor- that was valuable to Mark and everybody else. Mike. I mean it re- Mike, was it Mike? Sorry. Well, I hope Mark got something out of it too. Um <laughs> The, it's, it's, I mean, how long has this conversation been going? Not between you and I, but between it within the Christian uh, community, you know, the, the battle, the battle of the translations. And I don't think it'll ever go away. So it's one of these things. It's still alive and well in seminary. I mean, nobody's really advocates for it in seminary, but in seminary, it's, oh, the the ESV or the NASB. I was one of the few who was like, I still love my NIV. And they're like, oh, this child. Dude, aren't we all learning the original languages anyway? Like, does it matter? (laughs) If anybody out there is getting ready to go to a seminary or some sort of uh, formal biblical education, show up on your first day with the Extreme Teen Bible. (laughs) Oh, man. Please. (laughs) Say, this is what I was raised on. This is the inspired word of the Lord. And uh, I do my homework really good because Jesus wants me to. All right, let's take another question. Okay. (laughs) You ready? Yes. This one is from Justin. Are we reading this, the last names? Did you get permission or am I doing an abbreviate? Uh, I mean, he sent it. You can just Justin from Texas. Justin B, baby. Justin B from Texas. Uh, thank you, Justin B, for Texas for, for Texas and from Texas for this question. And it goes like this: You said it wonderfully in episode eight that you can see the grace of God all over the Old Testament and the judgment throughout the New. I agree strongly. He is the same today as yesterday. And if all that we have said is true, and Jesus himself said he did not come to do away with the law, Matthew 17, and Paul said we should uphold the law because of our salvation, Romans 3.31, how can we then say that as Christians the Torah does not apply to our lives? Because if it under if I understand the Bible correctly on this, then there are steps that we should progress through in our walk. One, salvation through Christ, essential. Two, growing in our faith. Three, learn to love others as yourself. Four, learn to love God the way he wants to be loved. Three and four are spelled out in the Torah and walked out in Jesus literally. The good works of loving others are pointless without first coming to Jesus. This is a better definition of what I mean by Torah observant, because of a much longer study on this, I have come to understand sanctification as the process of sinning less and less each day as we learn to walk out the Torah as Jesus did. All that being said, I would just like to hear your thoughts as you go through what is expected of believers after salvation, not to condemn anyone who is not doing one thing or another, but because it's a fascinating topic to me. Or heck, he says, whoa, Uh edgy, or heck, (laughs) just write me back and we can chat it out. Thank you for your time. And thank you for the question, Justin B. in Texas. Okay, what do you think, Chris? Where are we starting here? Yeah, so... Tear them up. (laughs) A couple of of things, and this, I think I kind of want to start with uh, something very interesting that I... 
don't believe I've brought up on the show just yet, but it was something that one of my professors brought up one time, and he kind of put words to something I had been uh, experiencing or feeling, and I didn't quite know why I didn't like it. But I would hear people say all the time, I'm, you know, spiritual, I'm not religious, you know. They, they would, they would, you know, kind of make this, like, disparity between spirituality and religion. And I kind of always thought, I don't, I don't really like that, and I don't really know why. And I didn't give it too much thought at the time, uh, but I just kind of was like, that sounds stupid to me. Um, I don't really understand it, and I'm not trying to be disparaging to anybody who might Whoa, say that about Dr. themselves. Dr. Chris using the S word. Yeah, but that was how I felt at the time. But uh, one of my professors, uh, we were in a, um, I don't know, what it, I think it was actually an archaeology class, and we were talking about... Um, you know, the temple cult and things like that in the Old Testament. And yes, it is called a cult, um, those who worshiped Yahweh, uh, definitionally. Um, and what it had to do with was the religious practices. And basically, the way that my professor, Dr. Dennis Cole, uh, a brilliant man, wonderful man, um, explained it was he said, he said, uh, you know, people are like, I, or I don't have a religion, I have a relationship, you know, that sort of thing. Like, I'm not into religion, I'm into relationship. Well, the thing is, is that religion... I mean, that was the tagline of early 2000s youth groups across the country. Chris. Yes. Yeah. So much, You're so much that from this our wasn't youth group the... history. Well, <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, is that what religion is, is it is the... Uh, parameters for the human relationship with a deity. Religion is <laughs> your interaction, your relationship with a deity. That is specifically what religion is, and it encompasses, you know, all of the different things, and as Justin is asking here, that the deity, in, in the case of Christians, Yahweh, God, Jesus, the the ways in which he wants for his people to interact with him, that is defined as religion. And that is, and it is, we are given the parameters in the text of scripture so that it is organized. And we are, <laughs> as Christians, in an organized religion. That's what it is. It has, it leaves a bad taste in people's mouths and things like that, but that is because people are confusing religion with, uh, you know, like legalism and with, you know, some sort of pharisaical attitude. And they are looking at people who are trying to derive a particular amount of, you know, piousness or holiness or even the sanctification here that Justin is talking about, a quasi faux type of sanctification through their adherence to a religious system. Then people want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, well, these people are terrible, so it must be that the religion that they're holding up so high is also terrible, and that's just not the case. Religion is the way in which people interact with a deity. It is, in a sense, people-centric because it, it is the instructions for us as human beings as to how we are to uh, interact with God. This is kind of, you know, what his question is about. And Jesus comes and then kind of radically, um, and he cites Matthew 17. I'm not entirely sure where that is, but in Matthew chapter 5, I believe it is, and it might be 6, it's in the Sermon on the Mount. It's either at the end of 5 or at the beginning of 6. But Jesus says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law. I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And then people say, well, you know, what's going on with that? Because it seems that after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and then we get into the New Testament writings, then it seems like we're, we, we are not under the law anymore. So like the law is done away with. But there is a distinction to be made, a very important distinction between fulfillment and <laughs> abolishment. And what Jesus is saying is, I didn't come to render the law completely purposeless, but what I came to do was I came to fulfill the law. I came to meet the requirements of the law. The law was given, Paul says, as like a schoolmaster, as a set of parameters that told me I am not good enough on my own. It said, basically what the law says is that it's God saying to people, if you want to be in right standing with me, then that requires perfection. And if you want to be perfect, then it means that you 
you must do this and you must do this and you must do this and you can't do this you can also never do this you can't say this don't ever do this thing either don't eat this don't wear this and he goes on and gives all of these you know commands if you want to be perfect and of course the point is no one can be perfect so within that system within that law he provided a way by which people's sins might be atoned for they might be covered over uh, they might be dealt with and that was through the sacrificial system which of course was a foreshadowing of jesus because jesus was the one who came fulfilled every single letter of the law fulfilled it and in so fulfilling it, brought it to its full completion, whereby at this point we are no longer uh, required to meet uh, you know, those expectations of the law because Jesus already did it for us. Now, that doesn't mean that he did away with the law, that he completely destroyed it and just threw it away and said, we don't need this anymore. Rather, what he did was said, this is what this whole thing was pointing to. It was pointing to perfection. Perfection is only found in me. Here I am, I'm taking my perfection, I'm filling up the void in this law that none of you could fill, I'm putting a cap on top of it, I'm calling it done, and now you can look at the law as something that has been completed already, and you don't have to worry about meeting its requirements anymore. And what Jesus said, and what Justin kind of rightly points to here, is in his kind of, you know, four points to the Christian life, he's talking about in that point three and four there, he said, learning to love others as yourself and learning to love God the way that he wants to be loved. I think it's a very important distinction that he makes there, the way that God wants to be loved. That is religion. <laughs> that is organized religion. God tells you, this is the way that I want for you to love me. And you say, well, you're all wise and powerful and wonderful. And yes, I will love you the way that you want to be loved. And that is part of our responsibility as human beings in response to what God has done for us, along with that is to love people, you know, as we as we love ourselves, to love your neighbor like yourself, and to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So that just kind of opens up the conversation just a little bit. I'm wondering if you have something to add here at this point. Oh, it just opens up the conversation a little bit, he says. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Just a little bit, Chris. <laughs> well... I don't know a lot. I don't know. It opens no, up a you're lot. nailing it. No, I, I'm. You know, I'm. I'm not overtaken by the spirit to jump in yet. So if okay. you have, yeah, more to go, you should do that. Yeah. So like for me, I mean, that's that's kind of what I'm. What I'm. You know, taking away with this. He, he from this. He says, I, I'd I'd like to hear your thoughts uh, on what's expected of believers after salvation. So. The expectation for believers after salvation. No, the law is is has been fulfilled. So somebody came. There's actually this awesome song by uh, the band Thrice, who I have mentioned uh, several times. It's called Words in the Water. Um, and uh, Justin, I would encourage you specifically and uh, anybody else uh, who wants to go listen to it. It's Thrice. It's called Words in the Water. There's actually a version of it called the Polaris Remix, where they put in kind of like uh, some synth and electric drums and things like that. And I prefer that one a little bit more to the original, but either way, whichever one you want, it's really the lyrics that are very powerful. But he, in, in the song, is painting this picture of being kind of like out in this body of water and then seeing this kind of like book down under the water and as he kind of goes down to investigate the book he realizes that this book is like drawing him down it's like sucking him down and he's about to drown um, until all of a sudden he he turns around and looks and there is this hand that's kind of reaching down um, and pulling him up and it is the hand of this person who's saying I have you know this this book that was going to kill you <laughs> this this heavy weight that was about to drown you i have relieved you from that and i have you know allowed you to come up for air and and to breathe and to have new life and of course that person is jesus uh, but it's a very powerful song and it is in i think the life of jesus where the expectation of us as believers after salvation that is what we look to and it is something that i have talked about on the show before and i will continue to talk about that jesus when he came to earth he did not come only to show us what it means to be god but he also came to show us what it means to be human so in jesus 
life here on earth, he yes, he was showing us who the Father is, but he was also showing us who we are. This is how you are supposed to act. This is how you are supposed to move through the earth. And I would say one of the key characteristics of how Jesus moved in the earth and how he lived and acted was it was complete reliance on the Father. He had complete reliance on God. He had his his whole mind, will, his his heart, all of his emotions, everything was surrendered over to God. He said repeatedly over and over, I do nothing except what the Father tells me to do. Fortunately for us, we have the text of Scripture, which we so often forsake, we so often neglect, we don't go to, we don't actually study it and try to understand what it says, but we have that as a guide to tell us what it is that we're supposed to do. And then in addition to that, we have the Holy Spirit who bears witness in our hearts and tells us, convicts us of sin and of righteousness. This is what Jesus said the main purpose of the Holy Spirit was, to come into the world and to convict the world of sin and of righteousness, to help us discern between what is right and wrong. And where there are times when we're like, I don't know what's right and wrong, we have the black and white text of Scripture uh, to help us understand that. And then in times when we don't know what to make of the text of Scripture, then we have people who, you know, have studied. We have pastors and teachers and professors that, you know, can help provide those sorts of answers for us. One of the wonderful services that we get to provide here for people. However, what I think is expected of believers is what you what you said there in your in your question, Justin. I think you really kind of answered it. It's to love others like you love yourself, and it is to love God with all of your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind, the way that He um, wants to be loved. And I think honestly, uh, it looks different <laughs> to a lot of people. Um, there, it, there are certain parameters, like we said, in organized religion, I think that everybody kind of has to fall into. But then there's this great amount of freedom in being a Christian, in being a child of God, where it can look different for so many people. And for some people, living a life that really honors the Lord and going through that process of sanctification uh, that he talks about, and sanctification, very interestingly, can be, you can see something that is sanctified as it is something that is set apart for holy purposes. And I think that is kind of what, uh, you know, um, it is to be a Christian, that we are set apart by God for his holy purposes. But sanctification also can be uh, the progression by which we reach perfection. And I think that's kind of how Justin is using it here as he's talking about it. It is this sort of progressive uh, evolution, if you will, of the Christian individual, whereby, as I think he said in here, we sin less. You know, we're sinning less each day as we learn to walk out uh, the Torah, uh, God's law. We, we, we're, we're sinning less every day. And I think that that should be something that we, we continue to have our hearts and our minds molded and transformed into something that looks more and more like Jesus. It's one of the prayers that I pray every time I pray in, you know, my daily prayer that God would conform me. I've been praying it now over my son every day since he's been alive, that he would conform him, you know, into the image of Jesus. And there's not really, I don't think, a, a simple answer to uh, the question there, Justin, but I think I'm getting to it in kind of a roundabout way. We'll probably have to chalk this one up to the not answered um, <laughs> section, because I just don't really know if there's... That is what we aim for, Chris. Yeah. I don't know if there's one, you know, uh, real like a good sentence or a couple sentences that I could say this is what... that I would feel good saying this is what's expected of believers after salvation, except again for the third time now yeah kind of as justin's already put it here yeah you know that's very good and very thorough and very um i was gonna say orthodox but i <laughs> that is not the right word I, I i mean i think theologically what you're you're laying out is the correct answer to the question as yeah. much as you don't think you did, I think you did. How, what what are your so thoughts I'm, on that? Right. And so I'm not going to, there's nothing, I don't feel like I have anything to improve upon what you said. So I will go with my initial feeling about this question. Um, and it is a long one. So I will try to uh, do it in a, a way that is organized enough to understand. He 
at the top of his question, he says, because if I understand the Bible correctly on this, then there are steps that we should progress through in our walk. And he lays out four steps, salvation through Christ, growing in your faith, learn to love others as yourself, learn to love God the way he wants to be loved. And I would want to maybe ask more questions of Justin to see like how exactly this list was organized and how it was sort of put together because the thing that struck me was I didn't really like the fact that it was a list that it <laughs> that it was a sort of a straight line through yeah uh, is a, a, a bit instructional and I'm not putting that on Justin of course lists are a useful rhetorical <laughs> tool to organize multiple thoughts um, but whether or not those that list is in order or it is comprehensive or not, I, I would sort of invite a reframing of that idea. Because, you know, so what is expected of uh, someone after salvation and, and what does that progression look like? I think it's very helpful for a lot of people, especially people who need instruction and perhaps are new and w want um, sort of an achievable goal mm -hmm. <laughs> or, uh, or a direction to move in. And I would say that last one is probably the more accurate as far as my feelings about it. Um, it's not so much a, a, for me, after salvation, it's not so much a checklist of achievements. I think that that can backfire um, quite extravagantly in the life of, of someone seeking what God wants for them. Yeah. Uh, I think it's more of a, a collection of improvements that go in one direction. And that direction is, you know, towards um, a closer relationship with the Father and, of course, with the Son and the Holy Spirit. And it's in that movement towards God that the transformations uh, begin to happen. Mm -hmm. And it feels to me like they just sort of happen a little bit more naturally than maybe we could even, uh, and also slowly, <laughs> slowly and naturally and over a period of time and not in any particular order. And... Um, for anyone who is maybe in a in a place where they are looking for next steps in their walk or they are uh, maybe they're new and they're looking for, you know, how do I do Christianity good? And even if you've been in the church your entire life, uh, you can have this sort of mindset. And I think it's I think there is a phase in everyone's walk that throwing the list out the door it is the most helpful next step um, and I think it really characterizes um, not just what life is like but also the unpredictability and the depth that you look into when you're trying to see the end of where the the Christian journey is going, if you're trying to look down that tunnel and you're trying to see the twists and the turns and what the goal is at the end, uh, it can really distract you from what's right in front of you. And I think it's just, uh, there's something about just walking into it, letting go of the list, and moving in the correct direction uh, and letting the transformation and the changes and the direction and perhaps even the short-term goals um, be guided and led, perhaps imperceptibly, perhaps invisibly, perhaps inaudibly, uh, perhaps so gradually that like a tree, you don't, you could never possibly measure the increments of improvement in your your sort of earthly character uh, yeah. on a day-to-day -day basis. But there's something about going through life 
that way where you wake up one morning and you realize you're an entirely changed person uh, and it happens easily. It happens without you even paying attention. And I don't know if this really resonates with everybody. I expect it doesn't. Um, but in my experience uh, being a church leader and pastor and, and just general confidant to individuals, um, an obsession with measurable goals as far as uh, how good at Christianity you are can be so stressful. It can be so stressful, and it can be at times even <clears throat> at times even um, counterproductive, because some people have a temperament where if progress is not easily measurable and not being achieved uh, in the desired time or way, uh, that it can get really discouraging, and discouragement is, I mean, goodness gracious, the number one. Uh, obstacle to, I would say, a, a satisfactory Christian life um, or relationship with uh, our God. And so, yeah, I don't know. That'll be my sort of meandering uh, <laughs> non-answer. And I think in a lot of ways, and of course, this could go into a much deeper um, thrilling and bloody discussion and debate when somebody wants to do so. I'm just letting you know now. I'm just not interested in that, but um, also not really interested in making you think the way that I think either. Um, but it even seems like the, <clears throat> the life of Christ sort of had that led that example a little bit um, up until its sort of brilliant climax and I think that's uh, I think that's sort of how the life of the Christian is there's some you just do your thing you follow the father every day day by day you do your thing and then someday something happens that brings it all together and you realize uh, that the a transformation has happened and it's prepared you for this exact moment or at this exact time in life. And there you go. That's me chatting it out, Chris. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, I, I appreciate that. And it, you know, it got me to thinking and, you know, really in, um, uh, a lot of ways that is kind of what helps me is when I think about when I'm like thinking about what's expected of me as a believer, uh, it helps me to think about how has God dealt with me in my life up to this point. You know, I think about mm -hmm. my uh, my rebellions, my falling into sin, my uh, you know my whatever lackadaisicalness in my relationship with Him. Um, all of those different things. I think about that, and I think about how He response to me, how he treats me in the midst of all of that. And then it is just kind of the expectation is you, <laughs> I want you to look and act like me. And it is, as you said, it's a transformation. You don't go from just being, you know, whatever, vile and impatient and rude and selfish and unkind one day to looking like somebody who's full of grace and mercy and compassion the next. It does happen kind of incrementally, but to kind of, you know, again, answer answer that question uh, as cliche and lame as it sounds, um, you just got to keep your eyes on God, man. The more that we, the more that we turn to him and everything, the more that in the midst of our struggles and our temptations and trials and all of those different things, we're turning to him, we're leaning on him, we're going to his word, the he starts to create a unique person out of each one of us that is a different facet of who he is in and of himself, where we're all conformed to his image, but it's in this very unique way all at the same time. So I don't think the process yeah. or the path is the same for anybody. Um, and maybe that should be encouraging to every single one of us and to you, Justin. 
Yeah. And and while I sit here uh, quietly and predict um, all the holes that could be punctured in my statement, um, <laughs> <clears throat> part of that, of course, uh, that is not to say that uh, you should not be intentional and have steps and build habits. And, um, you know, it's not sure. like you just get saved and then just kind of doo -doo 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 -doo, I'll all be changed someday. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you, you know, you, of course, build habits and draw close and are very intentional about it. But the true transformation is not something that you can produce. I mean, you can uh, create the the situation in which that transformation can happen um, but the true transformation is not actually really your responsibility that is something that uh, God will do for you uh, and that is why it's so fun that it happens so imperceptibly because you realize oh oh I get it oh I didn't even do this <laughs> it wasn't it was not, uh, it was not me who did that. And that's, you know, that's kind of the point, I think. Um, and maybe that's a lesson that everybody has to learn in their own way. And uh, sometimes some people have to learn it in harder ways than other uh, others. And uh, yeah, generally in life, <clears throat> we very rarely learn the lessons uh, the easy way. We never, we never learn somebody else's hard lesson. Uh, we kind of have to learn those hard lessons ourselves. So Sadly. I understand. And some people's, uh, you know, some people's brains and their character and their thing, they they just like some structure. And certainly uh, do people of all ages and stripes uh, in all sorts of different transformative missions or goals uh, need, uh, you know, just some instruction some some structure rather um and i think that the bible the torah is and of i mean the whole bible honestly but you're talking about the torah here the torah is a uh, a wonderful structure uh, for when you need that and the rest is up to god okay i like it we did it we did not answer that question and i love it <laughs> and we're past two hours now chris Look at we us go. We are. We are. Um, I'm going to soon, if not already, I'm in my office here at the house. I might have uh, family out adoring. Waiting for beautiful... you. No, they're not waiting for me. <laughs> they're oh, here to see you're me. right. You're not the important part of that. Nope, I get it. I'm not anymore. No one comes to the house to see me. Ah, they do still, but um, they're here for the little boy. But um, But yeah. Yeah, I think this was this was fun. It was a good one. Always, they're always. I think my favorite uh, episodes are the when we get to respond to the listener questions. That's, so yeah, that's how it is. And you know, the good ones they always sneak up on you. You know, you know, we can never plan on doing a good one. But this was great. I had a wonderful time. And thank you to everybody who left reviews on Apple Podcasts specifically. Uh, if you would. Please leave us a rating and a review. Most of you listen to this on Apple Podcasts. I see you. I see the numbers. And uh, if you wouldn't mind just taking a second as this is playing in your ears, head on over to Apple Podcasts and, uh, you know, leave us a rating and a review. That would be very helpful. It is something we cannot, we cannot help ourselves with this. It is something only you can do for us. And uh, if you get any more questions throughout your life listening to <laughs> Ravel, uh, send them on in. You can send us questions, comments, uh, suggests, uh, interviews, suggest topics. We are moving into a season here where um, we are totally open to suggestions. We have very, very, very faint idea of uh, what we are planning for mm -hmm. the next, you know, season here. So if anybody's got anything that they are just uh, itching to hear us talk about or explore or study or whatever, uh, send us an email to do contact contact at ravelpodcast.com. Yes, do it quick, please. Oh, my gosh. Do it today. Do it now. Right now. Uh, contact at ravelpodcast.com. That's where you can do it. Uh, is there anything else I need to mention? I don't think so. Okay. There you go, folks. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Ravel. Make sure to tune in next week. 
Uh, and Chris, do you have any last words? Godspeed. Thanks for listening to Ravel. To learn more about who we are, what we believe, or how to support this ministry, visit our website at ravelpodcast.com. If you have a question you would like answered on the show or to let us know how we're doing, email us at contact at ravelpodcast.com. This project is made possible by the prayers and generosity of listeners just like you. dream last night that uh we were getting ready to record an episode and uh mm-hmm. arnold schwarzenegger was the guest <laughs> and, mm. and he showed up <laughs> and he had a joint <laughs> that's a big get <laughs> and oh my god uh he he offered me the joint and i said no thanks and then he passed it to you and you were smoking a joint with arnold schwarzenegger <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to pass up the opportunity, Chris. Look, I'm not saying I'm not saying anything, okay? Nothing that could be held against me in the court of law. But uh but. I'm just Arnold hit me with that I'll be back if you know what I mean. <laughs> me and Arnold are going to get in the chopper if you know what I mean, Chris. That's funny. <laughs> Get down. Hope you enjoyed everybody who listens all the way to the end of the podcast. Don't do drugs, kids, and read your extreme teen Bible. <laughs>